so uh, Professor Duke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. È un grande onore per me di essere qui con voi, ospite della prestigiosa Università dell'Italia di Roma, per parlarvi della nostra ricerca di memoria, il cervello e l'invecchiamento. I think I'm going to talk to you today about our work, um, both our public health community work and our research on pathways to healthy aging, something that I know all of us uh, deeply want to do. So the first question people ask me uh, when they find out what I do, a fundamental question in, uh, in our lab there is how do I know if I have Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is, it's when there's something you've been told over and over again, and yet despite that, you forget it. So for example, you've all been told over and over again, turn off your cell phones at the theater, so forth. Okay, so when Marco's cell phone goes off halfway through the lecture, everybody should point to Marco and say Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, and then we'll know to enroll him in our, in our Alzheimer's studies. So I run something at Rutgers called the Aging and Brain Health Alliance, and we support pathways to healthy aging in African Americans. So what is this pathways to healthy aging? What is our program? So it's got two parts. The first is a community engagement for public health. We run brain health and Alzheimer's prevention programs for older African Americans throughout the greater Newark area. And the second half of what we do is neuroscience research. We have collaborations with the community to advance understanding of aging and brain health and prevention. And I want to talk to you today about these two halves of what we do and how they come together. So let me start with the community engagement. Um, so the first question is, why focus on African Americans? So the answer is three parts. As compared to white Americans, African Americans are over twice as likely to get Alzheimer's disease, less likely to seek and receive treatment for Alzheimer's and other dementias, and over 50% less likely to participate in biomedical research. And so these three health disparities define the targets of our community engagement. And our goals, therefore, are one, to reduce Alzheimer's in the black community locally, to increase the opportunities for them to receive treatment if they do get dementia, and lastly, to expand participation in older African-Americans in research. And that'll be the sort of the second half of what I talk about. So we've been doing this for 16 years in the community. We have deep roots and lots of partnerships. And I want to tell you a bit about this uh, really exciting stuff. Um, our, all of our engagement in the community is led by a, a senior leadership team um, that includes Glenda Wright, who spent a quarter century doing uh, tenants advocacy for low income tenants in public housing. She handles all of our engagement with public and subsidized housing. Reverend Glenn Wilson, a local pastor who handles all of our relationships with the churches and Dolores Hammonds, who deals with all of our current participants and sort of maintains their satisfaction and involvement. And the three of them together bring 200 years of experience in the black communities of Newark to sort of guide what we do. Um, and really I, I stand with, behind them when it comes to figuring out how we're gonna best serve the community. Um, they're supported by a range of, of, of scientific and other staff, by postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, undergraduates, and some of the community members who all come together under their leadership to, to uh, engage with the community. And I'm gonna introduce you to, to one of them and let them speak for herself about what- Hi, puts on an event, there's always something to learn. My enjoyment is to see the residents that are really in the underdeserved population. My enjoyment is to see them come and to see them learn about Alzheimer's. This type of event is so necessary for all of us because maybe one day we can put Alzheimer's behind us. Uh, the kinds of programs that we do in the community often have titles like Aging Smart. They're all about how you can uh, preserve your memory and, uh, and live a long and vital life, the health and lifestyle factors that are involved. Um, and what are the things that we tell people? Um, so let me give you a, a brief summary. Um, we tell people one, exercise regularly is critical. Challenge your brain, use your brain, think of it like a muscle to use. Manage stress, okay, stress can be toxic to the brain, particularly for women's brains. Uh, get a good night's sleep, sleep is when the brain is restoring brain function. And if you're not getting good night's sleep, you're not getting that restoration. Uh, socialize with other interpersonal communication, 
um, is really critical to keeping your, main al your, your brain alive. Being socially isolated um, is a big risk factor. Eat a healthy diet, a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot of Italian food like we have here. Um, so these six steps will cut your risk for Alzheimer's in half. So it's been estimated that half of all cases of Alzheimer's um, are due to uh, health and lifestyle factors that you can change. Um, so now the question is, well, I have a memory disorder. How do I remember these six steps? Okay, it seems like a conflict. So if you look under your seats or your chair, I've left a little magnet for all of you. You can go on your refrigerator and uh, it reminds you of the six steps to brain health. We also have, I didn't bring any with me, but we have a, a booklet that you can download on our website that has a lot more information and detail on these six steps. We pass it out at all of our events. Uh, we just launched uh, last spring a new newsletter, a, a public health newsletter. And I brought the very first issue here for you and it'll come out three times a year. Uh, we distributed uh, about 5,000 copies at local churches, senior centers, participants, and we mail it to our donors and others. So that's our new newsletter. Uh, one of the pastors says to me, so if you're a memory expert, can you help our participants who can't remember Bible study every Wednesday? So I got together with our pastor and we wrote a booklet called 10 Top Tips from Brain Science for Memorizing Scripture. Um, and we have pastors on our team who go out to the Bible study and use this as sort of a guide to how people can memorize scripture or anything else. Um, we're particularly interested in those who live cognitively vital lives into their late life. Uh, we have a program honoring exceptional African-American superagers. Um, we view these people not only as uh, role models for the community, that despite the demographics is not destiny, despite the overall statistics on African-Americans, there are many who live tremendously vital lives, um, but we're also interested in studying them and understanding what are their secrets for, for, for living these long, vital lives. Hey, and we have a big community event like this. This is the Silver Shepherd from the East Orange Senior Center for the geriatric rocket. The Silver Shepherd represents sort of our ideal of healthy activity. I was asked to take care of my grandmother. I went to take care of her and I took care of her every day. So, and we also try to involve a lot of the state and local government in a lot of these programs. Um, uh, a big problem for us has always been getting enough men into our studies. When we first began back in 2016, only about 7% of our attendees and our participants were men. So very small. Um, men, especially older black men, but all men are more resistant than women to both health education and research participation. Um, but men and women's brains are different, okay? They're different structurally. They're different because of a history of hormonal exposure. And Alzheimer's disease affects men and women's brains very differently. So unless we have enough men, we can't really understand what is going on in men's brains as opposed to women's brains with aging and Alzheimer's. But so we can only really understand these sex differences in Alzheimer's if we can enroll enough men. And that's been a big challenge. And so some of the ways that we've been trying to address this challenge of getting older black men, um, one is we do special programming, focus on men's egos. All men like to think that we're superheroes. Um, and uh, we know men won't come for health or education because we know everything and we're invulnerable, um, but we trick men by coming in for something like classic cars. So we're having uh, a classic car show and men's brain health fair combined for the first time here at Rutgers University Newark, and the purpose is to reach out to men who traditionally don't come to health education events with local churches with their men's ministries. There's a lot of the fellas within the community that are, um, are interested in, in, in old cars, new cars, they have mechanical uh, inclinations, so uh, we use a little trickery, like the, the car show here, and then say, okay, well look here, there's a doctor over there, why don't you go uh, get a blood pressure exam? So, that's one of the ways to get men to health and education. Uh, we also partner with local men's ministries, church ministries, and we help support the ministries um, of a whole bunch of churches so that we can sort of run these sort of health and wellness breakfasts that they run every Saturday and try to sort of leverage that. Um, we've just begun a new approach to uh, men's outreach, um, which is a partnership with a group called the Returning Citizen Support Group. Uh, there is a, a large number of older black men who get released from prison back into society. Um, many of whom have been away for 20, 30, 40 or more years um, and have been living a very unhealthy and eating an unhealthy diet and are beginning to rebuild their lives. 
Um, and particularly with some of the de-incarceration movements, there are more and more who are being released. And so we partnered with this group, um, which supports these men, and we've hired two of, the, two of the members of their group, Jerome on the right, and uh, in the red shirt on the left is Johnny. Uh, and Johnny's an amazing fellow. We just, we just hired him to be our new research assistant. In 1979, in our junior year, when he was 25 years old, he went into prison. And 41 years later, namely last year, he just got out. Um, so he spent 41 years in prison. But while he was in prison, he, uh, he got his associate's degree. And he's come out and he just came out last year. Uh, he's getting his bachelor's degree at 66. He's getting his bachelor's degree at Rutgers. He's in my introduction to neuroscience class. Um, and he's working with us as an assistant um, with a lot of our research and particularly with engaging with other men coming out of, out of prison. And he's a, a wonderful role model, a reminder that no matter what mistakes you've made in the past, there are opportunities for redemption and second chances. And that it's never too old to learn or even to get a degree. And he'll be getting his BA at 67 next year. Um, so now with all of these programs getting up, uh, we're not where we want to be, but we get about 20% enrollees. And that's just beginning to be enough to uh, begin to look at some of the sex differences in aging and Alzheimer's disease. Um, all of our partners, we have now, it says 33 churches. We're actually now up to closer to 50 churches, uh, 13 public and subsidized housing sites, and about seven other organizations, all of whom sign memorandums of understanding so that they're clear what our commitments are to them and, and what we expect of them and vice versa. Um, the, uh, so the, in summary, a community engagement team is essential for doing uh, outreach in the African-American community. Regular programming that brings value to people's lives, uh, builds trust and familiarity. And a community stakeholders board with a clear stakehold and investment in the program is a critical part of our commitment to transparency and, and to meeting the needs of the community. And that contrary to sort of popular view of African-Americans not participating in research, uh, we find that with all of this structure, we actually have a lot of people very eager to participate in research. Um, and they do enroll in, in our studies, which is what brings me to the second half of the talk, um, which is to tell you a little bit about some of our neuroscience research that builds on the uh, engagement of the black community. Our program is called Pathways to Healthy Aging in African Americans. And since 2015, we've had over 400 older African Americans who joined the study and this program. And they joined for two reasons. One is self-interest, to improve their own brain health and reduce dementia. And everyone who joins, we think of it as a program as much as a study, and we're committed to trying to help them improve their brain health, their vitality, and reduce their risk for Alzheimer's disease. So it's as much a program for the community as it is a research study, but also to support research on aging. And most of the people who are in our study know someone, a family member or a friend who's had dementia. And for them, this is their way of paying it forward to try to sort of fight back against Alzheimer's in general and particularly in the black community. So everyone who joins, we call them a VIP. We try to treat them like a VIP and that stands for a very important participant. And uh, who's eligible? They identify as African-American or black regardless of where their parents are born. Um, they're 60 or older. Uh, and they speak English fluently because a lot of our tasks uh, depend on English. Um, so what happens when they, they join the study? What do they do? Um, they get what they call what we call a, a Rutgers brain check is how their doctors, the medical system refer to this. They come in, they do saliva for genetics, blood tests for brain health, immune health and diabetes. And of course we give them feedback. If there are anything that shows up, we, do, we, you know, we provide them and their doctor feedback. They do two and a half hours of cognition, health, fitness and lifestyle measurements. So real deep phenotype. And then they come back for brain imaging and EEG studies that are done. So we collect a tremendous amount of data from people. Um, and then for those who are willing, we do three days of home EEG sleep monitoring. So we get a really detailed understanding of what's, what's going on in their brain. And they can earn up to $200 and they come back every two years from this study. Um, and they or their doctor can get copies of all the data that we collect. So it really is something that sort of is of value to them and their doctor, the brain imaging, the blood tests and everything else. Uh, so in summary, the Pathways to Healthy Aging program, it's a longitudinal study. We're following people um, who are African-American, age 60 and above, who are cognitively healthy at the time that they enroll. We don't enroll people once they have dementia. Um, we do three days of extensive testing on them. And, uh, and there are many health and educational benefits. So the idea is they're coming not just for the money, not just to contribute, but because we're really trying to use some of our study to provide them and their doctors with guidance. So what have we discovered so far? Now here comes the science part. 
Uh, so I want to give you a peek at just a few of the exciting discoveries that have come out of this program and some of the research that led up to it. So there are three knowledge gaps. So, you know, our science is driven by the things we don't know. There are three knowledge gaps. The first is we need new measures of cognition and brain function that can detect the earliest, it's also known as the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. And I'll explain what that is and why that's important. Um, we need to better understand how genetics um, and the modifiable lifestyle factors that we talked about, how do these interact to determine who's gonna be at highest risk and who's most vital? And lastly, which interventions will have the greatest impact on which people for reducing the risk? That's the second question. And the last is we need to ensure that these and all other advances such as early, in both early detection and optimized interventions are applicable to those populations at highest risk, especially African-Americans. So let me tell you a little bit about this. We need new measures of cognition. Now, why do we need new measures of cognition for early detection? Okay, so we've developed what we call the Rutgers generalization tasks, which are helping identify early cognitive decline many, many years before dementia, sometimes 10 or 15 years before it's obvious. Um, and the reason is that what we call having Alzheimer's, okay, is really just the last five years of a 25-year sequence. And many people often know about, say, pancreatic cancer. You talk about stage four pancreatic cancer because nobody knows stages one to three because it's silent. Well, really, when, what we call Alzheimer's disease, diagnose Alzheimer's disease, is probably more like stage four Alzheimer's. And these first three stages that could be going on for 20-some-odd years are sort of silently killing the brain. And so by the time you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's, 80% of the damage is done. And so if you think of Alzheimer's as being like termites, it's like saying, by the time the, you know, by the, time the housing and the rafters and the walls are falling in, you no longer have a termite problem. You have an entire structure of your home is, is, is falling apart. And solving your termite problem isn't gonna help the home at that point. So what we really need to do, what we really need to do is we really need to identify 10, 15, 20 years beforehand when there's a problem, because that's when the brain is still largely healthy. Um, and that's when there's the opportunity to stop it before it gets worse, before it's really affecting your life. Um, what we've discovered is that the earliest cognitive changes are not to memory loss. People associate Alzheimer's with forgetting things that you just were told, okay? Like, you know, forgetting to turn off your cell phone because you were just told it, forgetting what you had for breakfast, so forth. That's what we associate with sort of Alzheimer's. But we've been, what we've argued from our, our, our research is that long before those memory loss, that the ability to sort of store memory is, is lost, what you're seeing is the loss of the ability to flexibly apply or to generalize knowledge from one setting to another. So let me explain here, what is generalization? Generalization is the transfer of past learning to new situations, okay? So let's imagine the first time that Marco was exposed to broccoli, okay? And it made him sick. So Marco's really quick. It only took him one trial of getting sick from broccoli, swore off broccoli for the rest of his life, okay? Very fast learning. That was fine. The problem is, what happened the first time when, when Marco's mom served him cauliflower? Okay, now this was a challenge because cauliflower is kind of like broccoli, but not exactly, okay? It, it, so Marco's challenge was, do I eat it? Okay, because it's something new I've never seen before, or do I avoid it because it's sort of like this thing that made me sick? And that's the fundamental challenge of generalization, this ability to take what we've learned in the past and apply it to situations that are similar, but not quite the same. And that's how we adapt to a sort of a constantly evolving and novel environment. Oops. So here's the, an example of how we do this in the lab. These are tasks. Uh, we have what we call these generalization tasks. They're little video games. They have a learning phase and they have a, uh, a generalization phase. And they're all based on animal paradigms. So there's not a lot of language involved. There's, they're animal paradigms that we know from lesion studies and physiology studies depend um, on key brain structures. So in this first task, the beginning, you might ask, where's the hidden smiley face? Is it the red uh, octagon or the yellow octagon? You would guess. Um, and if you guessed left, you'd see there's a smiley face there. So you've learned this and many other things are happening simultaneously. Um, you might learn that red octagon beats yellow octagon. And then later in another phase, when you're doing lots of other things, for the very first time, you see a yellow cross and a red cross, and that's a new stimulus, a new pair. But if you extracted the essence rule from, the, from earlier, then 
you would know that the rule that red means yellow. So the idea is that there's a rule that you've extracted from the first phase that you can apply in the second phase, even if the stimuli are, are different. So that's one kind of generalization. Then we have a number of these different types of generalization tasks, all sort of based on rodent conditioning paradigms. So in summary, these Rutgers generalization tasks are new cognitive markers for detecting early cognitive decline towards future Alzheimer's disease, and I'll show a little bit of the data later, and long before the standard neuropsychological measures that a doctor will use can pick up the deficits. The doctor basically, the neuropsych measures that are used in a clinical setting basically tell you you have a memory problem when everyone in your life already knows you have a memory problem. The question is how to find out earlier. So that brings us to the question, where and how does the brain Give, give us the ability to generalize past learning to new challenges. What's, what in the brain is critical for generalization? So that brings us to the second gap, which is we need new measures, not only of cognition, but of the brain function underlying this cognition uh, to uh, detect the earliest changes in brain function uh, 10, 15, 20 years beforehand. So the hippocampus um, is the brain structure that, that we've argued is critical, it lies in something called the medial temporal lobe or MTL, which is the, the, the acronym. And it's key for storing new memories. And we've argued that it's also key for generalization. Uh, we wrote a book about 20 years ago, which is now on sale at Amazon for like $2. The remainder column, it's a bit humiliating uh, after all that work. Uh, and uh, where we argued from a computational perspective, we built computational models of the hippocampus and showed that how the hippocampus could be critical for encoding information and for generalization. So all of the work that we do now traces its roots back to these computational models and sort of machine learning approaches to understanding uh, the hippocampus in memory. So our prediction then from our modeling back in the 90s was that damage to the hippocampus impairs the generalization of learning. So the question is, how do you damage the hippocampus? Well. Uh, some anoxia, the loss of oxygen, will damage the hippocampus. Strokes to the blood supply, uh, to the medial temporal lobe, can cause many strokes, vascular damage. The early stages of Alzheimer's disease, so the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease are in this medial temporal lobe and to the, to the hippocampus. Um, but there are other ways you can get it. So, for example, if you're hit in the head too many times by a, uh, a polo mallet, okay, <laughs> That's a standard way to get hippocampal damage. Um, so what's happening in Marco's head when he's getting hit by his polo mallet, okay? Okay, she wants to know. Okay, so uh, that's not Marco on the left, okay? But the little red thing, that's the hippocampus, okay? So when the hippocampus is fine, it, it, you can uh, do generalization. You can understand whether cauliflower should be like broccoli or not, okay? But when you damage the hippocampus, what we've argued in our computational models and our other experiments, animal experiments, human experiments, is that the ability to learn is still intact, okay? But the ability to generalize is what's impaired. So you can still learn that broccoli makes you sick and to avoid broccoli, but you're no longer able to learn, take things that you learn and apply them flexibly. So it's all about the flexible, the hippocampus is critical for the flexible application of knowledge to new contexts, to, adapt, to new situations. So what changes in the hippocampus then with the medial temporal lobes, we call it, during these early stages of Alzheimer's, so as to impair this flexible ability to apply learning from one situation to another? So let me ask you to imagine, just to explain what's happening in the brain, we start with a metaphor. Imagine two different parties, okay? And ask yourself, which one would you want to go to? So the first party is going to be a cocktail party, a stimulating cocktail party, Throughout the evening, small groups of people come together, chat about one topic, break off and talk to other people and kind of socialize around. OK, that's one party. So the part people start out like this. And this shows the, the, the beginning of the party to the end of the party. And you can see that these people are talking to different people, joining up with little groups and, and, and schmoozing with one group and then another group. OK, now another party is a boring dinner party. You're stuck talking to the same two people on your left and right all evening long. OK, it's constant. There's no dynamics. It's the same conversations with the same people from the beginning of the party to the end of the party. Now, everyone, I assume, would much rather be in the stimulating cocktail party. Right. So, in fact, the social connectivity of what we're measuring of these parties is how many different groups does each average person talk to across the party? OK, um, the fun cocktail party has flexible social connectivity. 
the boring dinner party has a very rigid social connectivity throughout it. And that's a metaphor for what we measure when we do brain imaging. So we look at, at various brain regions within the medial temporal lobe around the hippocampus, and we look at it across 10 minutes of a scan. They're just sitting in a, in a brain, in a magnet, doing scanning for 10 minutes. Um, and what we see is that the people who are beginning to show risk for Alzheimer's, declining towards dementia, these people have rigid dynamic connectivity. So when we look at the, the connections, the activity patterns between different subregions, it stays the same for those 10 minutes that they're sitting there in the magnet. But people who are vibrant and, and, and intellectually active, um, their dynamic connectivity is like the exciting cocktail party. The different parts of their region, just sitting for 10 minutes, not doing anything, just sitting for 10 minutes, their hippocampal region is just connecting and disconnecting and reconnecting with other regions. And what we show is that the degree to which these brain regions are dynamically flexible <clears throat> predicts the degree to which their cognitive functioning is flexible in generalizing from one situation to the other. So what we've made is a mapping from neural flexibility at this sort of dynamic connectivity level to cognitive flexibility in terms of going from learning to generalization. So in summary, the dynamic network connectivity is, is a new measure that we've developed um, for Alzheimer's risk, uh, which uses resting state functional magnetic imaging uh, to evaluate brain circuits in the medial temporal lobe um, that are disrupted in early prodromal Alzheimer's disease. So the second is we need to better understand how genetics and modifiable lifestyle factors such as exercise and sleep interact to determine who is at highest risk for Alzheimer's and uh, which interventions will help which people best. So why do some people get Alzheimer's disease? So there are multiple factors, lifestyle, like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, poor, poor sleep, being sedentary. Those are all big factors. They're also all elevated in the black community. Uh, genetics, different genes can increase or decrease your risk. And those genes differ depending on your racial background. And the environment, your social and physical environment, stress, noise, and pollution. So all three of these interact in complex ways, um, but only one of them are we able to change, which is lifestyle. And so that's really the area that we're most interested from an interventional perspective. Um, and what I wanna emphasize and I'll come back to is people like to think about, well, this is 50% genetics and 50% you know, uh, nurture and nature. But what I'll argue is that the ways in which these things interact are much more complex than just saying it's half this and half that. And the other point is that they differ by racial background. Uh, we know that, that to a large extent, Alzheimer's um, has many things in common with autoimmune disorders. Uh, many of the, gen the genes that are associated with Alzheimer's um, are genes that affect the immune system. And we know that the immune systems differ by racial group because our ancestors, our, 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 our immune system is tuned to the pathogens that were with our ancestors, whether in Northern Europe, Southern Europe, or Africa. So we know that immune systems differ depending on racial background, and that helps provide a perspective why we'd also expect to see racial differences in the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. So let me describe a little bit now about some of our current research on uh, interactions between genetics and lifestyle. So the three questions that we ask is, how does genetics moderate individual differences in how aerobic fitness predicts cognition? How does genetics moderate individual differences in how a cardio exercise intervention will affect? And lastly, how and in whom can sleep protect against Alzheimer's? So let me start by talking about aerobic fitness. So how do we measure physical fitness? So we, uh, we, we do very simple. We do a six minute walk. We ask people how far can participants walk in six minutes? And this is a, an estimate of their VO2 max, their oxygen, their oxygen max. Okay, now when we start by talking about, by looking at fitness across our healthy population, and we look at standard neuropsychological measures of cognition, these are the things that will happen if you take someone who's demented into a doctor's office and you ask them to do standard measures that do a delayed recall, what did I just tell you 10 minutes ago, MMSE, that's the mini mental status exam, it's an exam for dementia, it's the one that Donald Trump claimed he got a perfect score on, which basically means you don't have Alzheimer's dementia, which is kind of a low bar. Um, and or digit span, how many numbers you can keep, keep together. So we, we see when we use these standard measures that a doctor would give you, a neurologist or a neuropsychologist would give you, there's no effect. But when we use our generalization tasks, we do see an effect. So it suggests our generalization tasks are much more sensitive than the standard neuropsych measures, that as you increase physical fitness along the, the, the horizontal axis, that the more physically fit you are, the better you do with generalization, the more likely you are to appropriately generalize. Okay. 
But what we found of particular interest was that this isn't true for everyone. Um, which brings me to talk about the genetics of how people differ. ABCA7 is, is one of the genes that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. It affects proteins in the brain, and there are two variants on it. And I'm gonna talk about both the variants. Um, one variant, um, which is the one that's more commonly studied is called ABCA780. It's specific to those of African ancestry, which is one reason it's understudied. Um, and it's rare, the risk version is rarely found in those of European ancestry. Any in African-Americans, it is the, arguably the high, one of the highest risk, genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's. Having the risk variant will double your, your risk for Alzheimer's. Now there's another variant called the ABCA750, uh, that's short for a much longer number that I can't remember. Um, it's found, the risk variant is found in both the uh, uh, Europeans, uh, Asians, it's found across populations. Um, it's particularly associated with Alzheimer's in women. Um, and its risk allele increases just directly looking at the risk variant versus your Alzheimer's risk, uh, very, fairly mild, about 20%. So it, very, it has a very small effect directly on Alzheimer's. And I emphasize the word directly because in the past people just associated the risk variant with, the, uh, with Alzheimer's. So what we found by focusing on this, this variant here, what we found is we sorted all the people in our study by this ABCA750, the one that has only a modest uh, exchange. What we see is a very different. That those people who have the non-risk variant show a tremendously strong relationship between fitness and generalization. Those people who have the risk variant don't show any relationship. So what that suggests then is that this genotype is, critic, this gene is critically involved in the neuroprotective value of fitness. That it's not enough just to be fit, but you have to have the genetic predisposition to take advantage of that. Okay, and that was a paper we published a few years ago. So it suggests that you need the right genetics in order to take the most advantage. So in summary, in cognitively healthy older African-Americans, carriers of the non-risk variant show a strong correlation between fitness and generalization, but not the standard neuropsych tests of memory that are available today. Uh, in contrast, those with the risk variant showed no advantage to being more physically fit. And the implication then that the hypothesis is that this risk genotype may diminish the neuroprotective value of aerobic fitness. Um, so to summarize sort of the, the, the growing picture of some of these interactions, um, we see that we know that, that, that good brain function is associated with generalization, um, higher, better generalization at lower risk for Alzheimer's, and that aerobic fitness um, is good for the brain. Um, but this ABCA750 uh, modulates the relationship between fitness and brain function. Which leads us to the next natural question. That first study was cross-sectional. We took hundreds of people um, at one slice in time and looked across people. Does it also, so that's a fitness measure. Does it also affect the effects of, does it also impact the effects of exercise on cognition? That's an interventional question about each an individual. So that is, these people here who have low physical fitness on, on the left, lower left, and also poor generalization, can we, uh, can we help, sorry, uh, here. It says, can we help these people? Can we improve them? Can we improve their fitness? And in doing so, improve their generalization and perhaps reduce their risk for Alzheimer's. Um, and so that leads us to the second topic, which is how does uh, exercise, how does genetics relate to exercise? So our, our methods was a lifestyle and physical fitness assessment, the same thing I talked about. This study had five months of cardio, cardio exercise program, essentially Zumba to Motown, is how we would describe it, twice a week held in local churches, and then there's a reassessment after the intervention. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what this is now, but I'm sure you'd all be embarrassed to watch these 60, 70, 80 year old women uh, doing this on their own. So I'm gonna ask everyone to stand up. Um, and uh, everyone stand up. This is a good point. We're sort of halfway through the talk. A little acute effects of exercise on attention. I knew I knew Denise was going to be the first one to stand up. No shyness. Okay. So let me all. Uh, this, this is what it looks like. Okay. 
have a little cool down period. Thank you all. So these mostly women, they did this for 20 weeks. Um, and we looked at, we compared them, the participants, to a group that was similar in age, education, and, and sex, uh, but who didn't do the exercise. And we looked at their, both those who are high risk gen genotype and low risk genotype. And what we saw, and we're measuring here generalization error. So high is bad, low is good. And what you see is, is that the only group that improved were those who were in the exercise group, but had the low risk genotype. Those who were in the exercise and the high risk genotype showed no significant improvement. So there was a publication. So let me summarize. Older sedentary African-Americans with the higher risk variant showed much less cognitive benefit that is improvements in generalization from this half year exercise program. Um, the implication is that different people with different genetic variations may require different prescriptions for exercise interventions to improve cognition and reduce the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So we can sort of elaborate our, our schematic to show that exercise affects aerobic fitness and this genetic variant is modulating all of their impact downstream on cognitive improvements. So how does exercise rewire our brains? We're talking now about behavior and cognition. How is it rewiring our brains and changing our brains? Um, and so this is where we come back to that dynamic network flexibility, the sort of the cocktail party analogy. So what we see is that uh, those people in the exercise intervention group, okay, on the right, in the green, post-exercise, we see significant improvements in their significant improvements in their dynamic flexibility. So six months after they were in this study, uh, uh, their their brains are already younger and being more dynamically connected. Okay. Now we link the brain changes to improvement if we look across both the intervention and the control participants, because some control participants may have been. Yeah, that's what we think. And um, what we see is that. Uh, Increased neural flexibility after five <laughs> months. Who's ever running? Andrea, do you want to come up here and who's running? Uh, who's, that uh, increased neural flexibility after five months was associated with increased cognitive performance on general. <laughs> yeah, well. uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so, escape. There. Okay, right there. So, with linking, is this still going to work? So, so what we saw is that most of our exercise participants improved on both measures, both the, uh, the generalization measure, cognitive function, and they improved on the flexibility, the generalization. What's particularly concerning though, is that many people, primarily our control participants, who did no exercise in five months, in half a year, were already showing both cognitive decline and brain function decline. So in half a year without exercising in this population, you're already seeing measurable declines. So, and that's where I want to find the paper on that. So in summary, exercise promotes medial temporal lobe flexibility and may prevent increases in the rigidity across subregions and thereby protect against cognitive decline. Um, so what we see is what we're really looking for here is increased hippocampal or medial temporal lobe flexibility in these brain regions. Uh, this is work that got uh, a little bit of media coverage um, because it was sort of an exciting insight into what's actually happening in the brain. We all know exercise is good. This was telling us a little bit about how and why it's good. Um, which brings me to the last question, which is talk about sleep. Oh, I guess someone with Alzheimer's there in the third row. Okay, so let's talk about sleep, another modifiable risk factor. Okay, so remember I talked about there were two types of genes of this ABCA7 gene. The one I, I just was talking about is prevalent in all races and has only a modest direct effect, but we've shown a very significant indirect effect through exercise. The more common one specific to African ancestry is this ABCA780. Um, in African Americans, it will double the risk. Um, and uh, the question is, what can be done about it? Obviously, you can't choose your parents. Um, so what can you do about it with lifestyle? Um, and what we... What we found, first of all, we just sort of looked just to confirm the effect of this gene. Um, those in our population, in our cohort of older African-Americans with the risk genotype had both poor generalization, so more errors on cognition and less flexible medial temporal. So we, we confirmed that both our cognitive 
and our neural measures that, that this gene is associated with significant differences in this population. How do we help the people who have the, the, the high risk gene? Um, so let me just show you here. That shows that this ABCA7 is having, the 80 version is having a direct effect on cognition. Uh, but can quality sleep protect brain health in older African Americans? And what we found is, so we took 57 carriers who have the high risk genotype. Okay, it's a rarer form, fortunately. And we found 57 people who were match controls, the same, approximately the same age, education, and weight. And we compared them. And what we saw was that um, as sleep quality got better and better, the effect of the genetics washed out. So the idea is that self-reported sleep quality, self-reported sleep quality, eliminates the genetic deficits associated with this high-risk genotype. So again, genetics isn't necessarily destiny um, if you have sort of a healthy lifestyle to counteract it. Uh, moreover, healthy sleep, you see poor average and good, this is just self-rating sleep, um, eliminates the brain network deficits associated with this risk genotype. The people who reported good sleep had uh, the same sort of brain networks as those uh, who had the high-risk gene. Uh, so what we see here is that sleep quality can intervene and modulate the negative effects of this genotype. Um, and for over, moreover, in longitudinal data, we've shown that in those with the high risk, um, sleep, high quality sleep eliminated a two-year decline in rabble. Rabble is sort of the standard measure for identifying someone as having dementia. Um, that the high quality sleep eliminated the two-year decline in that score that was seen in those who had poor quality sleep among the high-risk carriers. So not only is it, it in the moment protecting them, but it's also longitudinally protecting their decline. So it's almost time for my nap, but not yet. So in the interim summary, ABCA7 doubles the risk for AD and Alzheimer's in, in African-Americans, and it's associated with poor cognitive and neural network health. Um, in our new study, uh, we've shown that good self-reported sleep can eliminate both the cognitive and the neural deficits associated with this risk genotype. And our preliminary quality suggests that it can actually offset some of the future cognitive decline. Now, I mentioned self-reported sleep because that's obviously one of the limitations here. We're just talking about self-reported sleep. So, which leads us to ask, what do we know now? Let me just summarize about genetics and lifestyle behaviors that we didn't know before, okay? So here's the big picture, okay, that I've sort of been moving towards. You can see how these two genes, these two variants of ABCA7 interact, but they interact in different ways with lifestyle. And that's why I said it's sort of a complex interaction. Um, in one case, we see a direct effect of one gene being modulated by a lifestyle variable, sleep. In the other case, we see a direct effect of a lifestyle variable, namely fitness, being modulated by another gene variable type. So it's sort of this complex interactions going on. Um, and that's really sort of one of the take home message that these interactions are complex between them um, and no single lifestyle or genetic is really gonna determine what happens. So I mentioned three cognitive knowledge gaps. One is we need new measures of cognition and brain function. Um, and I described our Rutgers generalization tasks, our dynamic network connectivity measures, we need to better understand these interactions between genetics and lifestyle and how they inform interventions. And I described one gene, which diminishes the neuroprotective value of exercise and, an and, and another gene, which uh, can be offset by sleep. And finally, in terms of ensuring that this benefits those who need it most, all of our data is directly relevant to African-Americans. So you might ask, is that all there is? Is you, are you working on anything else? So um, in the last uh, 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 minutes, I wanna give a brief summary of some of the other things that are keeping us busy. Um, uh, we're looking now uh, at blood, there are new tests that came out in the last year for brain pathology. Um, it used to be that you would have to either autopsy a brain or do PET imaging. Now there's sort of a new generation of blood tests that we're doing on everybody in our study. Um, and uh, through collaborators at Sweden, it's one of, the, one of the top labs in the world. And that's gonna allow us to actually measure changes and differences in the underlying pathology, the Alzheimer's, the plaques and the tangles at the neuronal level. Um, we're, this is, I mentioned, a longitudinal study. We have people now who are coming back for their two year, four year, six year, and eight year return visits. Um, and as we follow these people and more and more of them develop dementia, we're beginning to look, this looks at some of the ways in which our generalization tasks and our dynamic flexibility 
is predicting decline to dementia at sort of an end point. Um, the self-reported sleep is very crude, although it's been very effective. Um, and so our aim now, we're using uh, digital devices. This is called a dream device. Um, it goes on the forehead and people sleep with it. They sleep with it for many days. And it, uh, uh, and it allows us to get a real picture, not only of how they're sleeping, but the underlying brain, uh, uh, brain waves and activities that are happening during sleep. Um, we're particularly interested not only in, in sort of lifestyle and, uh, uh, and, and genetics, but also in the environment in which people live, the environment where you live uh, can also influence your health. It's often referred to as an area of social uh, determinants of health, social influences on health. And we've been working with the School of Criminal Justice and with the police department at Newark to get crime statistics throughout Newark. Um, and so that the typical way people look at social determinants of health is by census tract averages. So you live in this census tract, which may be how many, you know, some fraction of a city. Uh, we'll look at the average median income, the average poverty level and so forth. And then you'll associate that with everyone in that census tract. And broadly speaking, these sorts of census tract measures often referred to as area deprivation indexes are generally quite powerful, you know, across the country. When you look at data, you know, from, from one side of the country to the other. Um, because there's often a lot of homogeneity within a census tract in Ohio or Kansas or somewhere. But when you get to a, an urban center like Newark, a census tract is quite large, you know, and the quality of neighborhoods can vary block by block. Um, and so what we found is these census tract measures don't really tell you very much about the, the effects of, of, of social deprivation, of, of loss of, of resources in a neighborhood um, at that large level. So what we've been doing uh, with a School of Criminal Justice with the Newark Police Department is we have everyone's home address and from the using geospatially uh, databases, we can compute for each person in our database, we can compute how many violent crimes occurred in the last five years and we can measure the distance from each person's home to each of those crimes. And we can ask as an approximate how many violent crimes occurred within one block of your home in the last five years, 200 feet. So we go on from the census tract by using this sort of geospatial data to there. And what we see is that these area deprivation indexes, so always in the research, you're trying to compare, you know, the state of the art with the past methods, to what you think is sort of newer or better. And so these standard census tract measures have no relation to generalization, which is our, our measure. But if we look at violent crime, we see the, the more violent crimes there are in the last five years, literally on your block, um, the, uh, the, the, the better, the, the worse you're doing, the more errors you're making. Uh, and moreover, the question is, well, why is that useful? By the way, we have another measure, which I don't have here, working with the fire department. The fire department also geospatially codes all the abandoned buildings. So they know every building that's abandoned. They update that every year in case there's a fire. And so we've also been showing that proximity to abandoned buildings, again, you can get that to within 200 feet, is another measure that will predict a variety of health metrics, including brain health. So the idea is that in an urban environment, um, things like geospatially coded crime data and, and built abandoned building data gives you a whole a window at the kind of spatial resolution you need in a dense urban environment. So what's the use of this? Uh, is it just one more way to say, well, poverty is bad for you? That's not particularly uh, insightful or helpful. But what's it useful about this is then we can look at mediations. You know, what is it that's mediating this effect? And one of the things that we've been showing is physical fitness. That in other words, as you get higher and higher crime counts on your block, people's physical fitness gets lower, which makes sense. If you're scared to go out, you don't go out at night, you don't go for walks, you don't go shopping, uh, you stay at home and you lock your door. So we see here exactly that effect, of locking your door and staying home in the violent crime area. The physical fitness goes down and we already know that fitness is such a key indicator. So that's one of the ways in which we find us to look at that third factor, the, the environment. Um, I mentioned before that uh, the genes for Alzheimer's are all genes that affect the immune system. Um, and we know that the immune system, uh, it's also why COVID and not only so devastated the black community um, uh, as, it, as does Alzheimer's, the same risk factors for COVID mortality, obesity, diabetes, hypertension are the same as for Alzheimer's. And the reason for all these common comorbidities for COVID mortality and Alzheimer's is to probably both go looking at pathways through the immune system. And so as we draw blood from people, we work with an immune lab and we ask the question, do changes in immunological health across the lifespan, both innate, that's inflammation, um, and adaptive, those are T cells, um, relate to the risk and prevention for Alzheimer's disease. And second, for those who are infected by COVID pandemic, what are the long-term consequences for their brain health and immune function 
as that may relate to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we've begun with some preliminary data looking at, so T cells are part of the adaptive. We hear a lot about immune function, inflammation, that's sort of the first round. Once the longer term form of the immune system is, our, is the adaptive immune system, T cells, that's what's disrupted, for example, in HIV, we hear about low T cell counts in HIV. So we look at some of these things and we're beginning to see some of the relationships between how immune function may be mediating some of the effects of these genetics and health and lifestyle. Um, exercise and brain health, I, I showed you before one of our, our preliminary studies, we're about to launch a study that I'll tell you about in, in a minute. Um, it'll start in January, 2023. Um, and we're gonna ask a couple of questions we didn't answer, ask, we were able to ask before. Which aspects of brain function can be improved by which types of exercise? Um, lots of different types of exercise, particularly strength versus cardio. How do they differ in their protective value? Both are good. Um, what accounts for individual differences? We wanna look further at these genetic variants and also look at some of the other genes and other factors that may influence individual differences. Um, and lastly, by using these blood pathology measures that, that I was talking about, there's a fundamental question about exercise. We know exercise is good. We know exercise is good for you. Uh, we know it's good for your brain. We know it reduces Alzheimer's. What we don't know is, is it actually disease modifying or even disease slowing? Or is it just creating a compensatory uh, uh, reserve that allows you to be more resistant to it? So by looking at these blood measures, um, we can... Uh, we can actually see whether there are changes from exercise in these blood measures. Are they getting better or are they just getting, getting worse at a slower rate? And that's a sort of a fundamental question about exercise. Uh, we have a, a new project and a new grant with the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. And I have a postdoctoral fellow who's Nigerian um, who uh, stopped in, in, uh, uh, in Lagos and was taken out to a nice dinner by Lulia Dozian, our classmate. Um, and uh, she is uh, uh, setting up this study and the, the uh, at Ibadan, which is sort of near the Ghana border, um, the, is where you see the people of the Yoruba background, the Yoruba people. And that's a particularly appropriate group to be comparing because so many African-American descendants of slaves trace their family histories back to the Yoruba. So among the Africans, and there is by the way, far more genetic diversity among Africans than there is among Europeans or white people. So the difference from one part of Africa to another genetically is far greater than the differences you'll find within Europe or America. Um, now you might ask the last question, who pays for all of this? Where, where does the funding come? And for, uh, for those not in science or those who are here in Europe, the um, question is, how does one fund all of this? Um, we've been very fortunate for funding from, uh, uh, primarily it's the National Institutes of Health that funds all of this. Um, and uh, last night I had a lovely dinner with the, uh, Alessandro Corsini and John Hansen and uh, Alberto Moncado. And when I came home, um, I, there was a notice of award, notice from NIH that this last pending grant for about five million was awarded. So that was my sort of after one. You might think you might think that sounds easy. You you write a grant, go out with a couple of aristocrats on the Via Margoto, you come home and you get a grant. Okay, um, but in fact, okay, this is this this is. This, not showing here. Can you, is there a way to get rid of that? Thanks. Okay, but the truth is NIH is really slow and conservative, okay? It requires lots of pilot data. This grant, which looks like so easy, go out to dinner, come home and get the notice. It took us five submissions, okay? So four times we got rejected, we took the feedback, we revised and we submitted over a course of two years. And that built on five years of pilot data that came from some state funding to collect the initial studies. So in fact, it took seven years, five of pilot data, two of five submissions before you get it. So NIH is an extremely slow and conservative uh, route to funding, um, which is why we rely so much on our philanthropic, on our brain health angels. Um, and brain health angels um, are private donors who allow us to quickly, faster than seven years or two years, pursue exciting high impact, high risk projects, get new projects off the ground with preliminary results, leverage this support from the, from the, uh, the, the, the philanthropy to then get the longer term, larger NIH funding. And so it's a model that most of you are familiar with in the finance world. It's really the model between venture capital, uh, which seeds people and, and ideas, uh, a subset of which then go on to get a, an IPO in the stock exchange. In the science world, it's philanthropy that plays the role of venture capital um, and uh, NIH is like the stock exchange. So we're very grateful for our synapse level support.
supporters, our neuron level supporters, and especially our cerebrum level supporters, um, all of which is tax deductible. On so that brings me to the end. Thank you. Hey, Mambo, Mambo Italiano, hey, Mambo, Mambo Italiano, go, go, Joe. You mix up Sicilian, all you calabresi do the mambo like a crazy with a hey, Mambo.